<laughs> so, um, I was just reflecting, John and I were working back in, together in the 1980s, which makes us positively a uh, stone age. Um, but I'd also like to say how delighted I am to be sharing a platform with Naomi, who uh, was absolutely instrumental in the Sure Start program and who was one of the most remarkable people I ever worked with in government. So it's a tremendous pleasure to be with you. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ancient history, but then uh, I'm going to segue from that into what I think should be, should be done now. And, you know, this is a, a report, obviously, that focuses on living standards, particularly child poverty, historically and now. It's revisited the official government data and concludes that child poverty has been rising much faster since 2011. And then it predicts, obviously, the sharper rises in poverty and, and child poverty in particular to come. And obviously, as you would expect me to draw attention to, with respect to the record of the Labour government, the analysis demonstrates that poverty and child poverty fell more than was previously thought. In fact, we were much closer to meeting or even exceeding in parts our child poverty targets. That analysis follows on others that have been conducted on the record of the Labour government since it left office. For example, the Institute of Fiscal Studies analysis of our tax and benefit reforms found that relative to the Treasury baseline, Labour reforms were highly progressive, with the poorest three-fifths of households gaining most on average, with the richest households losing out the most from these changes. And there's a consensus now amongst all serious studies that absolute and relative poverty measures fell markedly among children and among pensioners. The setting of the child poverty target in 1999 was, was critical. And I can say to you now, it was also highly contested. Um, a lot of people thought we were tying ourselves to an unrealistic target or a target that was going to be used to beat us with at a later uh, point, which they weren't entirely wrong about, by the way. But nonetheless, I still think it was the right thing to do because it was also critical to then the policy changes that we implemented targeted tax credits introduced for working families, allied to record increases for child benefit for all families, and then, of course, the minimum wage, which was uh, a, a huge innovation. People forget now that the minimum wage really formed part of the Tory attack on the Labour Party, actually. Uh, sorry, forgive me for this, David, going back in history in this little bit. Back in the 1987-1992 the general elections, Today, I'm pleased that it's obviously part of the political consensus, but it's worth just reflecting at the time, it most certainly wasn't. But the attack on child poverty was more than simply about cash transfers, and I want to focus on this for a moment. They were an essential part of a wider array of measures to increase opportunity and mobility. The introduction of Sure Start, the cutting um, um, of the, 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 rather the increase in the school places, the turnaround and investment levels in the schools allied with critical reforms to drive the widening of opportunity, investment in the NHS and public health system. People often forget the difference that makes to people. Um, if the poorest people can get high access to high quality health care, that's a major change in their living standards and their quality of life. Um, the expansion of university education. Hardly reported at all until Gavin uh, Kelly's excellent blog was the new OECD analysis of social mobility. It tells us that actually in those years, the UK backed the trend in social mobility with the biggest fall in immobility amongst those on lowest incomes in the whole of the OECD. So basically we went from a situation where roughly uh, in the mid 1990s, six in 10 families on low incomes would remain stuck to four in 10. That's still four in 10 too many, but it's a lot better than where we were. And the point that I want to make is that none of this would have happened unless there'd been a set of policies that were actually geared to making it happen. And of course, there's more we could have done. There are people who quite rightly say we could have done more on housing, although we did invest a lot in social housing and uh, had an active strategy on homelessness. Um, and we did, it is true, uh, always ally ambitions for social justice along with creating a strong economy. All of this is the past, okay. Um, really the only point of interest is what does it tell you about where we should go in the future and for me the there's a wider lesson of the right governing mindset from then that's been lost today 
because the child poverty target was more than just a signal. It was the setting of a core objective from which sprung a whole series of economic and social policies across government, not just set from the centre, but driven through the system to engender real change on the ground. The lesson actually in how to set a culture of delivery was the biggest I learned in my time in office, and this area of poverty reduction was one where it made most difference. In other words, we didn't just set the target from the center, we tracked it, we made sure it was being implemented, we made sure that at each stage, the policies that we were agreeing at the center had some visible impact on the ground. This is the drive that I feel has been progressively lost in the last few years. A fatalism around the limits of policy has set in that seems to drift not just over this government, but across our policy debate today. An economic constraint is too often an excuse for policy stupor. We see it in this area. The drive to increase social mobility is gone. The short-sighted scaling back of programs like Sure Start, a symptom of the diluting of genuine ambition to target support for families and wider an opportunity. The child poverty target has in effect been abandoned. Universal credit may have been started with a serious intention to simplify the system, but simplicity has now given way to complexity, with the effect felt not just in short-term hardships, but in the loss of the targeted support and action that set, sat behind the child poverty pledge. And what we're left with now is a kind of fatalism that nothing can be done and the decline is inevitable. So the question is, what do we do about it? And I have two reflections on this. The first is, and this um, goes in a sense directly to the work that the Resolution Foundation is doing and my institute is doing as well, which is to try and dig deep down beneath the figures and find out what is really happening. Because there are certain things that I don't think we fully understand at the moment, but that we have to understand as a point of analysis if we're going to get the right policy prescriptions. For example, there's job growth. Okay. There's no doubt about that. Very high levels of employment, as this uh, paper shows. Actually, now that is in increases in full-time employment as well. But post-crisis, there's much lower wage rises. Post-tax, post-transfers, there's actually stagnation amongst many levels, um, many sectors of, of the population, um, especially around the middle. The top people have done extremely well. But actually, if you look around, not just those at the, at the bottom, the lowest deciles, but actually if you go further up the income scale, if you compare pre-financial crisis, post-financial crisis, the rises in real living standards have been very, very much smaller. There's a fall in home ownership. There's a rise in rental. There's therefore a rise in housing benefit. There's a rise in housing costs. Productivity hasn't really shifted. So between 2007 and 2018, it's grown around about 1.2% on average. If this was the pre-crisis productivity levels had been carried through post-crisis, there would be about 25% increase in productivity. So what is holding this back? What's making sure that this doesn't happen? Investments low. Job to job moving is 23% below, as the report shows, 23% below what it was pre-financial crisis. That obviously, of course, has an impact on wages, since often people get increases in wages by moving jobs. So my first point is, we need to delve much deeper into what's really happening to the economy at a macro and at a micro level, between different sectors, between different segments of the population, in order to understand the right way forward. And then we need, frankly, a new policy agenda. We need an agenda that has, at its heart, measures that are innovative, imaginative, future-oriented, and effective to produce greater social justice and greater opportunity. In housing, for sure, um, those figures on housing costs are really stark in the, in the report. Infrastructure, I think we still, I would personally like to see us take a, almost a 19th century view of infrastructure in this country today. In other words, we should be renewing it in a, in a 
with a much greater sense of national purpose than what we have at the moment. Issues around social care and the National Health Service, for sure. How do we educate people through life? How do we deal with the significant numbers of young people that still get either no educational opportunity or very poor educational opportunity when they're very young? Social cohesion, including issues like rising crime, but also social exclusion. I mean, if you look again at the figures, there's a section of the population for whom virtually no traditional amounts of policy work in raising their living standards or opportunity. There's obviously issues to do with immigration, but how do you get a policy that's fair, that has rules without tipping into prejudice? Tax and spending. How do we tax? What are we taxing? Are we taxing in the right way? If you look at the composition of spending, you know, I think it requires a really a, taking a step back and looking from first principles. I mean, if you think about tax and spending and you look at all the changes in the way we live, what we know, how we work, and then you look at the tax and spending system, it hasn't much shifted. I will say to people, government itself has got to be radically reformed. You know, one of the interesting things is if, if Clem Attlee came back to the UK today, you know, he would be staggered at all the change. You know, he, he, I mean, he would look at the social change, the economic change, he would be absolutely bemused by it, astounded by it. And then he'd go back into Whitehall and feel completely at home. So the question is, how do, we, how do we make sure that government is actually fit for purpose? And then I think one thing that is not really part of the policy debate in the way it should be today is we're facing a, a coming technological revolution. It really should transform the way everything happens, the way everything works. It's going to have an enormous impact. I don't feel we are really geared up uh, to deal with it. Um, and by the way, what a pleasure it is to be talking about something other than Brexit. But yeah, anyway, um, it's also got relevance when we look at you know, what the policy agenda should be. So I think the other thing that we need to do is to say, what is the right policy agenda for today's world? It's a question. So my two reflections on this, apart from the obvious one, which the policy makes a difference. You take your eye off child poverty, you stop understanding the importance of cash transfers and programs like Sure Start, you're gonna get a rise in child poverty. But my broader reflection is, how do we get the right analysis today of the way the economies change, particularly post-financial crisis in society, and what's the right policy agenda for the future? In that, I've no doubt the Resolution Foundation will continue to play an active part, as I hope my institute does as well, and I look forward to collaboration between the two of us. I think the work that Torsten and his team are doing is literally some of the most important work that's going on in, in policy terms in this country today, and I really congratulate them both on the, the quality of the work they do and its genuine uh, comprehensibility. And at some point, I hope those that are charged with policy making in our country today listen to the types of things you're saying uh, and act upon them, because if they do, we'll end up with a society both more cohesive, more fair and more just. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. We, we so nearly got to the end without Brexit, but then <laughs> in it came. Yeah. Um, but we also uh, got a reminder that policy matters um, and the policy agendas matter, and having one is a desirable thing to do. Naomi. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for your very kind words. I thought I was invited for gender balance. So I realize now it was because I actually had something to say. And just to attest to what so was... you're not being invited again. Yeah. <laughs> just, just to attest to the experience of that checking to see if targets were being met, being at a number 10 meeting reporting on the progress of SureStart was one of the scariest things I've ever done, but incredibly useful so, uh, and the right thing to do. Um, I, I, I was thinking about my dad in, in preparing what to say. So uh, my father was an immigrant to the United States, was very successful, born in Vienna, was a refugee. And when I said to him about the shame of the United States and child mortality, he said, that's because they count the poor people. So, I mean, it was a very weird thing to say, you know, it's their fault if they went to the doctor on time, if they, you know, if they, if, so it was all about kind of where we are now on, it's the behavior of people rather than whether they have money or not.
And I think that's really what I want to talk about because um, I'm not an economist. So why does money matter? Well, at the very least, people can't buy stuff and that's bad for the economy. It's probably good for the environment that people don't buy so much stuff, but the economy runs on people buying stuff and not having money means that you can't buy stuff. But we also know from Michael Marmot's brilliant work on the, on the gradient that being poor is bad for child outcomes. It's bad for educational, social, emotional, and health outcomes. And that money matters. It has a direct impact on child outcomes, not just mediated through behaviors. It has a direct in impact. And it's quite simple to give examples of that. If you're you know, in poor housing, there's no quiet place to do homework parental conflict. I bet everybody in this room has rowed with their partner at some point about money. Well, the less money you have, the more you're going to argue with your partner about money. And arguing with your partner is not good for your children. So those sorts of things, money really matters for, for children. And diet. So those of us who uh, you know, said, oh, try a little broccoli. If you don't like it, we'll have something else. Well, if you can't afford much to feed your children, you're not going to afford waste. So you're going to give them what you know they'll eat. It's not the poor people don't know what good food is. It's that you can't take the risk of them not eating what you give them. And all that business about, you know, you can make healthy foods on two quid a week. Well, it takes a lot of work and a lot of time, which most poor people don't have. And services matter too. And I'm glad that you mentioned how important the reform in public services were. Of course, because it gave me a job. That's not the only reason it was important. Good public services can ameliorate the impact of poverty. But as poverty rises, demand for services rises. And that's a real conundrum that we're in now. And the use of supportive services will depend on other pressures in life. And I think that's another thing that's often missed in policy. So, you know, the, the government wants everybody but, well, wants poor people to go on parenting programs. Well, if it's having my washing machine fixed or going on a parenting program, I'm going to have my washing machine fixed. And I'll go on the parenting program if there's a free laundrette and I can do what's important to me at the same time. And I think that's what's missed out in all the stuff about changing behaviors. Um, the, the, the last thing I want to say is that so we did reduce child poverty. Did we get the improvements in child outcomes that we had hoped for? And I think we overpromised because it takes a huge amount of time. And our difficulty is about consistency and persistence of effort. And as things change, you lose momentum, you lose the data. And I think the fact now that we've even tried to define poverty by parental behaviors instead of by actually having money is a very bizarre notion and one that's incredibly unhelpful. So my five minutes is probably up. I'd like to say I really welcome the data. I congratulate everybody who was involved in the project that actually did a massive amount and was incredibly privileged to be part of it. I fear for the future in terms of income and in terms of services, but we know we can do it because we did. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Naomi. It's a good reminder that even if even if policy can make a difference, change is very hard. Yes. John, you're not allowed to go back to the 1980s. But what would you like to say oh, about the 2000s? I was going to, I was we don't want your ancient history. I was going to start in about 1961. Okay, I think. <laughs> um, we haven't got all day. Um, right. Okay. Um, first of all, um, uh, it's, probably, it's probably compulsory, but can I, like everybody else, welcome the audit? This is a really helpful. Um, contribution, um, and please read it. Um, it's, but it is sombre reading. Um, I think it's also particularly helpful um, and very brave of you to do a now cast of kind of actually where we were in 2017-18, which is still actually um, nine months ago, um, and that's even more sombre reading um, for everybody, but particularly uh, for people on low incomes. And I think one of the things we should draw from that is um, that there is a lot more of that to come as the delayed effects of the July um, 2015 budget come in, um, which have really only been very partly shaved um, since Theresa May became Prime Minister. Um, we've got the continued freeze um, of, um, of, of benefits uh, for working age people. Um, when inflation is running at over 2%. So that two, minus 2.8% you had in the graphs earlier, that's just the beginning of a sequence we are going to see continuing for the next few years. Only one-tenth of the people who DWP think will eventually be affected by the two-child limit 
are currently affected by the two-child limit, which will have one of the most dramatic effects on child poverty hitting the, the larger families. And as time goes by, because of turnover, because of mobility and churn, more and more people who were receiving universal credit, assuming it does carry on being, um, being rolled out, which the NAO tell us we have no alternative to, um, whatever its problems, uh, more and more people who are on universal credit will be quote, counted as new cases. They have been off benefits for long enough to be a new case and therefore won't be um, protected by even the cash-linked transitional um, relief. And that's uh, that the, the current recipients get. All of that is built into the system. That's what delivers most of the £12 billion worth of cuts um, by 2020-2021. Um, by, uh, and that's all before one allows for the administrative problems, the difficulties, the, um, the, the completely self-inflicted problems caused by the payment in arrears of universal credit, the delays, and the administrative difficulties of it. So there's, there's more, sadly, it looks as if there's a lot more of this to come, and the year you're, you're focusing on is, um, um, is, is a taste of, of, of what we've got more of to come. Um, also, a particular welcome to um, your... Um, I'm very shocked to discover this is ancient history. Um, but to, to look back and to focus on this problem, which, I mean, just reading it, it's obvious that we should have been thinking about this before. And it's um, shameful that um, those of us who have looked at these numbers um, have not raised, um, thought about this and looked at it before. Um, we put a lot of effort, or rather um, the D, uh, DWP and ONS and the Institute of Fiscal Studies put a lot of effort into coping with underreporting at the top and uh, allowing for um, the way in which uh, people um, with very high incomes aren't very good at responding to social surveys. Um, they're very, very good, by the way, at responding to surveys about how cultured they are. If you look at, if you look at the Great British Class Survey, that. Um, which has the best response from chief executives who had 20 minutes to say that they listened to jazz as well as, um, as, well as going to Shakespeare. Um, and, and they were down there with the lads in, on the football field. Um, they had 20 minutes for that. They don't fill in ONS surveys, though. So we adjust for that. We could do it better. My colleague Stephen Jenkins and Richard Burkhauser have suggested ways in which we should be doing better in terms of adjustment at the top. But this focus on underreporting of benefit receipt at the bottom and the potential effects of that is very important. Now, I think we've got to be a little bit careful about this. We already have, before housing costs, after housing costs, I like something called with housing incomes. We adjust for inflation, we don't adjust for inflation, we have property lines that are fixed and move. The Sociometrics Commission is going to be reporting in the autumn, pointing out a whole load of other ways we should be measuring these things, some of which have less cheerful effects than, than some of this. And there's a danger there that, I'm, I'm sure Tony would be an exception to this, that, that politicians will pick and choose the measure that suits their case. But um, this shows it went in the right direction at the right time, so we focus on that. So we have to be a little bit careful about it. But this is big. This is material. Something that suggests that we've been overestimating the Gini coefficient by three percentage points is material, and therefore we need to think about it. Um, um, and it also does, as everybody said, give us reasons to be cheerful. We did do better than we thought in the early 2000s. We got close, or even possibly um, hit. On, we were on track to Tony's Toynbee Hall speech pledge to end child poverty within 20 years, um, which would have implied halving it, um, as it was. And, and you, know, you can't you can define what, it, what, what, what ending meant. But, but it shows that policy makes a difference. And I very much hope that that's not ancient history. Um, but it also implies that things are getting worse faster now. Because if we've been underestimating the, uh, the, the, the receipt of, of benefits at the bottom, the fact that they're being cut in real terms and in other ways um, is more serious for what's happening at the bottom. So, so the news is bad. So I do hope that DWP and ONS um, will be taking this um, very seriously. Um, data linkage, matching up to administrative data, um, will help. Um, but the great advantage of this is we can't do the data linkage uh, retrospectively. What this gives us is a time series rather than just saying, oh, look, it's three percent percentage points better. 
well, actually, it's always been three percentage points better, and, and, and this gives us a way of, of, of thinking about that, the other ways of doing it. And it's not the only problem we face. I, I just looked, the, the response rate to the 2015-16 Family Resources Survey was 56%. I don't know what it, it was in 2016-17, but this is a big problem. If little, only a little over half of the people we want to be talking to are responding to these surveys, it is conceivable that those people are in some way special or bored or um, need somebody to talk to. And then adjusting the data we get from them to try and shoehorn them into um, fitting the rest of the population becomes a harder and harder um, exercise. Let me end with, with one thing, which is thinking about the future and thinking about universal credit. Because one of the things that the report focuses on is the way in which the, another implication of this is that we've been misunderstanding take up that benefit take-up has been better than we thought it was. Now, that is absolutely critical in understanding what the effect of universal credit is going to be. If you look at the modelling work done by colleagues at Essex University and by the DWP of the effects of bringing in universal credit, it suggests there will be some quite big benefits to people with very low incomes who are people who claim some of the benefits they're entitled to, like housing benefit or like child tax credit, but don't claim other benefits that they're entitled to, like income support or means-tested income-related income job seekers allowance. The assumption behind everything that's been said about how universal credit will have benign effects is that under the new system, instead of being so complicated that you have five things to claim and you only get around to claiming one of them, um, they'll get, once you, you claim, you'll get universal credit, you will therefore be getting the child tax credit or the, or the equivalent of job seekers allowance you weren't getting before. But if we understood take-up better and non-take-up better, we would understand how much of that non-take-up is down to stigma, is down to the campaign against welfare that we see on the front pages of many newspapers a lot of the time. And my fear of this is that the benign interpretation we've been putting forward, that universal credit may have some benefits right at the bottom, may be completely misplaced if what happens is that the stigma that was affecting income support, job seeker allowance, but not affecting tax credits by design, is carried over to everything. And we then end up with a larger number of people living on fresh air. We simply don't know. It may work out okay, but we need to understand those reasons, the, the levels of take-up and the reasons for non-take-up better than we do at the moment. And the work you've been doing is a step in that direction. I hope other people will be able to take that further. Thank, Thank you, John. That was a uh, lovely depressing ending to uh, <laughs> add on there. The guy hiding at the back, George, is actually about to publish a paper on benefit take-up and mm. some of the very detailed issues you're uh, raising. Because basically, improved benefit take-up is the reason we are now pushing ahead with the universal credit. Mm. It's, the, it's the thing left, the, the prize out there. Um, although I'm slightly less pessimistic than you, just because that's a healthy place to be in life. Uh, but you can all now tell why everyone's been going to John for 13 <laughs> years uh, since the Land Before Time, because he knows lots. Um, now, let's get your questions, your answers, your thoughts. The gentleman over on the right wants to kick us off. <coughs> the mic's wandering around you. Keep your hands up, we'll take a few at a time. Go ahead. And tell um, your in reference to child poverty, uh, Tony mentioned that there was kind of very much from the centre, there was a mission that everyone kind of gathered around and the economic and social policies followed from that. I was wondering how that sort of mission-oriented approach could also encompass civil society and business actors so that all parts of society are working towards a common goal. Great question. What was your name, sir? Uh, Andrew Bennett. Andrew. Correct. Who else is coming? <laughs> Chris? Oh, Alison, you go first. I'm off, Chris. Sorry. Um, Alison Garner from Child Poverty Action Group. Um, the achievements of the child poverty strategy were enormous. A million children taken out of poverty. And as you say, um, Tony, the biggest falls in child poverty in the whole of the OECD. Very impressive. How has it been so hard to get even Labour to celebrate and defend this achievement, <laughs> number one? And number two, how can we get all party consensus again around this? Because the effects of the rises we're seeing today are going to be devastating and we need a new, renewed effort on child poverty. Right, and then Chris, and then we'll answer that, and then Tony can tell you why British politics is broken. Chris Giles from the Financial Times. It's very nice to be taken back to the 90s where we had uh, tax revenue growth of 7 or 8% a year <coughs> and no ageing population. In the 2020s, we're going to have neither, most likely. What does the panel think we can do in those straightened times? 
question. The, um, okay. Well, Tony, do you want to do the future of British politics and civil society? And then we can open up yep. Yep. Um, First of all, I think if, if, if you're going to get action on, on child poverty, um, you need to try and build a, a political consensus for it. And you know the, the struggle we had over the minimum wage, I think, is, gives some indication of how you might go about doing that. Because um, the reason I... I gave the example of it being heavily contested in the 87 and 92 elections, is that, not, not just to point out where politics was, but also to say that at that point, you know, the minimum wage was a kind of slogan, but we didn't, we hadn't really tried to build the right consensus amongst business and civic society for it. And when we actually thought we were going to form a government, which was a, a sobering thought, given we'd been sort of almost 18 years in opposition. You know, I started to give a lot of thought, as did uh, uh, Gordon, as to how we, how we managed to introduce the minimum wage in a way that took it from being a slogan and made it part of a kind of national mission. Because the politics around that is quite different. And that, from that, we got the Low Pay Commission. And from that, we got a way of doing it so that it didn't satisfy um, some of the demands for it, but nonetheless it managed to establish a consensus behind it. It, it basically worked and, and, you know, as I say, nowadays no one would think of getting rid of it. And I think we've got to do the same around child poverty by not just making it something where it's, it's just a sort of um, slogan on a banner, but explaining how many other social problems mm. come into being as a result of it. One of the reasons we did Sure Start was not just in order to give people opportunity, but also to create a situation which fewer families would be excluded, fewer families would then become what you might call problem families. I mean, when you start to break down the analysis, of, for example, of where you spend money as a state, an enormous amount of money is spent targeted on particular families, usually I'm afraid not really very effective in what's happening. And we came to the conclusion, unless you took a long-term approach to things like how you make sure that from a very early age parents are given help and support and kids get the, the chance of a proper education, unless you did this on a, on a much more comprehensive basis for the long term, you were never going to make an impact on, on social problems. And in the end, by the way, that is, I mean, others will answer this third question, but if these investments for the future do end up creating a more prosperous society, right? So you, you do end up, it, it's got an economic function to it ultimately, but you, it's, you require to build it by consensus and take a, a, a long-term view. Why, why, why isn't the Labour Party celebrating it more well? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a... Uh... Look, let me try and answer this positively. I think one of the great things about the Resolution um, Foundation is you've got Torsten, obviously, who is uh, in the Labour Party policy. You've got David, who's obviously a Conservative uh, minister. Um, you know, th there is... There are two types of, of, of politics going on in the West at the moment. One is about riding the anger, and the other is about trying to provide the answers. And that is a really a very stark difference. And one of the reasons why I am so interested in getting deeper into these questions of what's really happening to our economy and our society is not just so that you come out with policy solutions, but that so you get an idea from that as to what is the right political coalition that you can build for today's world. Because you're only going to get some of these issues handled if you, ch you switch the policy agenda. Okay. Th these things only become important to politicians if the conversation changes. If the conversation's about the types of things that it's about at the moment, these things get pu pushed to the side, right? So it does begin with an analysis of what's going on. This is really, you know, I, I have this debate with my own people in the Institute because we've just started this policy work that we're doing. 
and you know, I really mean what I say about the work the Resolution Foundation is doing. Understanding this and getting from it, a cor from that correct analysis, a set of policies for the long term that will involve, in my view, changing the political conversation, that's the challenge right now. Because otherwise, you've got two visions of the past competing as a way through to the future, and that is really a pretty bad place for the country to be in. Right. John, do you want to touch on Chris's uh, fair question, which is maybe, yeah. you can, maybe you can get job poverty down by spending yeah. more money, but we haven't got any money? Yeah, well, let me, let me uh, use the opportunity, which nobody's done so far, to give a plug to the, um, you'll see green copies of it lying around upstairs, to the recent report of the Intergenerational Commission um, that um, I was um, um, uh, very privileged to be part of, run by the, um, run by the foundation. Um, and um, that focuses on that kind of challenge of where tax is coming from, where the demands are coming from as the population changes and as um, the circumstances of different generations are turning out in a very different way. And I was trying to summarise this the other day and it seems to me that one of the central challenges of that is you can summarise it as being how do we make sure that the old get care and that the young get housed. <laughs> However you look at that problem, it is going to require more public spending as population ages, as we want more of the kinds of things, particularly, particularly health and social care. And that means we do, if tax revenue isn't buoyant by itself, because the economy is not buoyant, we are going to have to put up tax rates. And we're going to have to look at the resources, the incomes and assets of people which are currently lightly taxed by comparison with, for instance, the earnings of the working age population. And that means um, the incomes and assets of the baby boomers um, who are better off, not all baby boomers, but um, those of us who are better off. Um, I don't think there's any escape. I think that's the central challenge, and it's a more difficult world. It was, I mean, in one of the things that, if we're going back to ancient history, the um, part of the increase in national health service spending um, was funded by an increase, a small, modest increase in national insurance contributions. Um, under the Labour government. I think we need to think um, about um, how we tackle social care. We're going to have to pay for it. We've got a very poor system at the moment and we could do better. One, our answer to your question, Chris, which I think is a really fair question, which is a, um, a kind of more political take on what John's saying is um, that if our, like, leave aside like lack of majorities and other things, but like the structural pressure is we are now in a tax rise era, not in a tax falling era, looking back over the 30 years we've just had and the 30 years we have. And so we're all, what I say is we're, we're all structural social democrats now, as in we are going to have a bigger state just to have the welfare state we've got. The, um, and the tough thing, which is something you're pushing us on, it, which is to have the adult conversation about what is the tax base that lets us have that, that doesn't. The alternatives are the tax base we've got and either out of control debt, probably not, or child, higher child poverty, worse health service and an education system we're not prepared to stand for. And so that when I say we're all social democrats now, I mean uh, everyone. That's why you've got Theresa May and Philip Hammond not saying we've got £20 billion for the NHS and, that mean, and we're going to fund that by cutting ta corporation tax more because that's going to bring in more revenues, instead saying we're going to raise taxes. Now, there's a small problem there about passing some votes and all apparently this democracy thing requires votes for tax rises, I've heard. Uh, so they've got a problem, but... That's our uh, answer. Now let's get some more questions before I'm conscious we're running out of time. There's a gentleman in the middle, there's a lady at the back. Anyone over here? And Rob, there's a guy at the front here. Hi, I'm James Ferguson from the Macro Strategy Partnership. Um, I have a question for, for Tony Blair. Um, there were some great things achieved during your, your tenure, particularly as you've pointed out on the, on the social front. But from a macro point of view, what that seemed to result in is that we went from about 45% of government spending going on entitlements and 55% uh, going on, on government departmental budgets. And now that's switched. That's so now we've got 55% plus going on entitlements and only 45% going on um, departmental budgets, which means that all of them, from the NHS, through education, through defence, through policing, through transport, all of them are being squeezed by that simple measure. And that is because benefits have replaced them. And at the bottom 60% of the population take an average household income of £8,000 in benefits. And it's pretty much the same at, 
at the top end of that, 60% as the bottom end. <clears throat> so if that's all a good thing, but we also have tax rates at close to the highest levels we've had post-war barring uh, a brief period, we're faced with a choice. And that choice is, do we raise the tax rate to hitherto higher than we've ever borne before levels? Or do we find some way of getting more of the people who are working and on benefits back off the drug and into better paid full-time work? And I, I don't know the answer, so I'd love to hear what you think. <laughs> that's good. That's good. It's good to have a question that is definitely not on the consensus. But since you, pr I mean, I'm going to let Tony answer in a second. But the, the ratio you're talking about between Amy and Dell changing over that period, which is true. So Amy is now bigger than Dell. Um, the Department of Budgets, Dell, Amy includes benefit spending, includes, but is not just benefit spending. That ratio has changed because we've slashed the hell out of our Dells while Amy carried on growing. And there's this thing called debt interest, including those Amy things. But I'll come back. Oh, we'll see. Uh, have a view. Let's get some more questions before we get to some answers. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Rees and I'm from the Women's Budget Group. Um, so recently we published a report analysing the causes and consequences of women's poverty. And one thing that really struck me was that single parents are one of the groups with the highest levels of, <coughs> sorry, of poverty. So 48% of single parents are currently living in poverty, so almost half. And also half of, of children of single parents are also living in poverty. Um, and something that seems to be at the core of this is the challenges in combining caring responsibilities with paid employment. So I was wondering what the panel thinks uh, that is failing uh, these parents and uh, what can be done about it. So what, what policies could be introduced to, to take care of this issue? Thank you. Great question. Another gentleman here. Hi, Mike Jankman from PwC. Um, Tony made a, a reference to an even older bit of history when he mentioned a, a 19th century uh, approach to infrastructure building. Um, and given the, the tax outlook that we have and that Chris referenced earlier, uh, I was wondering if you could expand on that and, and think about which areas might be particularly uh, impactful and, and cost effective, the sorts of issues we've discussed this morning. Great. Um, Naomi, do you want to kick us off on? Any of those, or single parents in particular? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, the difficulty is that work doesn't pay anymore. So you have a significant number of lone parents in work, but not on sufficient incomes to pay. And that's because, in part, that's because of the slashing of tax credits and slashing of other benefits. So when we had the income transfers, then going into work was a sensible thing to do. I mean, the other thing I want to point out about the costs in terms of childcare is that childcare is a very low wage industry. So we have more women poor because they're working in childcare and delivering not particularly high quality childcare. So this is a very, very expensive thing to fix. I'm, I don't want to say how you can fix it without higher taxes because I don't think you can, but it's a very, very expensive thing to fix. And as you say, it is highly gendered and highly gendered not just for lone parents, but for couple families as well. Carrie Oppenheim and I are just working uh, on a book. And one of the things that I found quite shocking is 3% of couple families where both were in full-time work, both in full-time work are poor. And I think that's shocking. Tony, if you were doing politics uh, now, in a kind of elected sense, the, um, uh, would you be arguing for a higher tax burden? Um, I think I would in certain areas, yeah. I mean, I think, for example, if you look at housing, um, you know, the council tax has really had its, had its day. Mm. Uh, we published a policy paper recently from the Institute around housing and how you switch to, to, to land as, as the right basis of taxation. You have to do this over... A, significant period of time. Um, I think there are other things that we should be looking at taxing now to, to, to uh, you know, we, we, we look at things we want to discourage and we introduce tax. We've done this already in relation to things like pollution, yeah. cigarettes, etc. You know, I would look at that too. Sugar. Um, huh? Sugar. Let me want you Sugar. To Sugar. Yeah, absolutely. I would be uh, uh, very tough on that. So I think there are but I think you also want to, to take a step back and look at your tax system as a whole and what you're taxing, what you're getting out of it. And I think the answer to what James says, apart from the points you rightly make, is that I think you're going to have to take a, as I say, a, I think we're at a point now where you're, you're going to have to come out with a policy agenda that's quite radical around, you know, 
how, I mean, this productivity question is essential to dealing with any of these issues. So what, what's, I mean, how much of it is part of the national debate at the moment? I mean, not to really, not to a huge degree, I would say. And yet this is vital. What's the difference, for example, that this, the technology can make to healthcare, to education, to transport, to law and order, to a whole series of, of, of things that will change the way that we run government? What are the types of, you know, when, you know, when, when I was in office, obviously we focused on education, education reform. I think I would be taking a different attitude today towards uh, adult education. We need to, mm -hmm. you know, I always used to say that if you, if you ever um, had to make a, a, a dramatic announcement that you didn't want people to notice, give a speech about training. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, it's changed a bit. Ed Miliband used to repeat that line to me. He used to do my nutting. He used to say, you're not giving your vocational education speech. Everyone will go to sleep. I'd say, you're out of touch, bugger. Anyway, sorry, personal history. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blaming you for other personal yeah. problems. Yeah, I can't remember his vocational. He didn't do it. Didn't he? Oh, okay. He won, he had well, he won the argument. Right, and if he had done that, I still wouldn't have remembered it. But, it's, <laughs> but the point is, and that's not a reflection on Ed. Just, but the point is, so I, would, I think, you see, this is what, 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 where I think we are in politics at the moment is essentially you've got a politics of pessimism. Right. People are fearful. Right? This is why when you look at, the thing that's really interesting to me is when you look at the polling around, will the next generation do better than this? Now, the generational promise has held good for years and years and years. People have always thought the next generation could do better than, than we're doing. That promise is gone. That's not what people think. And if you've got a politics of pessimism, you look for people to blame. Or you look, you're, you're more comfortable with solutions that respond to your anger than provide answers. And that's why, you know, right wing, look, the reason why I think it's so important that the left doesn't go for a left form of populism is that if the right populism meets the left populism, I can always tell you who will win that battle, right? The right wing will always win it. But we need to create a different, that's why I say you need to create a different policy agenda and construct out of that a new political coalition. And that is the way you're, in the end, get to these questions, because I think we're at an inflection point of society and the economy, and I, you know, I know I'm slightly obsessive about the technology part of this. And my um, kids say to me, by the way, my 18-year-old wants to read history um, and and Excellent. and does drink. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Phew. Yeah, there you go. So, all hope has not been lost. Exactly. Possibly, right? But you know, my children always say to me, "Don't talk about technology, or if you do, just mention it, but move on because." <laughs> We have a lot of proof that you don't understand it. But I, I, I think that this, this is, you know, we're about to hit a new workplace revolution. So this is the moment when you really do need to have an agenda that is forward looking and that is change making at the same time. And the trouble with, with I think, the politics, you know, if I can be self-critical, the politics that I represented was in a different era in one sense that, as it were, it was obvious there were certain things we could keep, there were certain things we could change, but we weren't at this inf inflection point. We are now, uh, so we've got to become the change makers, but it's got to be change that is, corresponds to the modern world. If it's not, then you'll end up with a fight between two types of populism, and out of that, I fear the wrong, you know, the rightist populism will, will win, and that will send us down a very dark path. And, you know, since I promised I wouldn't mention Brexit, but I do just reflect, our growth would be higher if we weren't doing it, and therefore our revenues. Okay, John, anything you want to add? No. Okay, well, should we get some more questions? Because we're going to have to wrap up after one more set. There's a gentleman in the middle of the back there, and there's two ladies over there on the right. Hi, yeah, my name's Councillor Mike Roberts, and the reason for mentioning that is um, I've been a Labour councillor, Tony, in Aldershot, which is a tough town, a left-behind town, probably a bit like Sedgefield, where you used to represent, um, since 1976. I've seen, in my war, deprivation um, and disadvantage in 1976, and the latest health uh, profile reports uh, for Public Health England yesterday 
suggests there's been no change in my ward and many areas of, of the country. So you never mentioned local government at all. Um, and we feel very disillusioned with most national governments because we've lost about 52% of our monies in recent years. So, um, you know, one, how in your policy thinking are we going to deal with that? And secondly, how are we going to deal with the left behind areas like Mansfield, like parts of Aldershot? Right. And then Hi, um, my name is Alex and I work mostly on digital policy. Um, kind of in response to what Tony said about technology being something that's a critical point for us at the moment, but isn't something that we're focusing on, it's something that we skim over. Um, how can we bring the technical digital revolution into the debate about work and benefits? Because it seems like it's going to be a crucial, a crucial thing for us over the next 10, 20 years. The automation of work, is, is UBI something we should be seriously considering? Or do we need to really rethink what a good job is for the automated era and make sure that we're creating a lot of them? But at the moment, it just doesn't seem to be something anyone's really interested in talking about. And obviously, what Tony said about infrastructure feeds into that as well, making sure we've got the equipment for it. Um, but I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts. OK, great question. Hello, my name is um, Harriet. I work for an organisation called Social Finance, but currently I'm working in Lambeth to work out how local policy can better respond to the mental health and other inequalities facing black people in Lambeth. Um, so it was really heartening to, you know, one of the conclusions was that policy can actually make a difference. And so my first question was whether it was in scope of this report to look back um, at the achievements in the late 90s, early noughties, and, and understand whether those targets might have been met for um, children, particularly from black and Asian um, backgrounds, since we know from the race disparity audit, audit that we are more likely to live in low-income households. And secondly, in a similar way to the question with respect to um, single-parent households, I wonder if the panel had any view um, on how in particular child poverty um, affecting um, ethnic minorities can be um, impacted by policy successfully. Great. OK. The... Um uh, briefly, Stephen, do you want to touch on the, um, uh, the BME question, which we haven't covered in this report, but we did cover last week? Yes, yeah, so um, in answer to your question, we, the, we haven't specifically covered off uh, different ethnic groups in the report, but we could, the data can be cut um, by um, different ethnicities, and therefore we could look at um, poverty rates in the adjusted measure going back. Um, it's also worth saying that um, we published a report last week, as Dawson said, on, on the, the pay penalty for ethnic minorities in relation to, to, to white British groups and how that's not shifted that much over time. So perhaps in other areas we still see lots of progress to go, but um, yeah, those are two plugs that I'm happy to do. Tony? Um, on Mike's issues, I mean, first of all, on, on local government, I mean, I think... I'm not sure where we go from here, actually, because I think there's, um, it's going to become increasingly hard to also to get people, if they're working within an area where they just, they, they feel that they're simply handling all the time a, a decline, it's going to be extremely difficult to attract people, people into it. Um, but obviously, you know, as I found in government, many of the programs you want delivering can't be delivered unless you work with local government. I mean, I would simply say on the left behind areas, I mean, again, I think you need to identify those and focus on them specifically. I don't think a, um, a rising tide will lift every, mm -hmm. every boat. And I think that's true about people. You know, one of the things I was working on before I left office was that core group of families that are completely socially excluded, that go from generation to generation in social exclusion. And your normal policy does not really deal with those people. I think there's, there's, it's the same for communities. Um, I mean, I obviously represented a community that was uh, at the poor end of the spectrum. There were a whole lot of policies that we did that made a difference in health and education and so on. But I think this is more like um, the, you know, what happened, for example, when the coal industry in the 1960s was, was shut in the Northeast. There was an actual focus on those specific communities with specific, actually at the time, there were corporations set up specifically to look at those communities. I think we, we need to get back to something like that. And um, on the digital policy side, I think the, pro the problem is that politicians find this very hard to understand. I mean, one of the things that I'm trying to put together at the moment is um, 
a, a sort of unit or center where you've got change makers and policy makers in collaboration together. Um, there's just a, there's a failure for the policymakers to understand what exactly is happening. I mean, obviously, this is partly the distractive impact of Brexit and so on, but it's also at a deeper level, you know, this is hard to understand, you know, and the politicians that are um, active in this space today, oftentimes they're more interested in talking about how you regulate the big tech companies, which is an important question. I mean, don't misunderstand me, but to me, the really important thing is, what is the difference that it's going to make? What are the risks we're going to have to help people with? Because it's going to make an enormous change, I think, to, to the workplace and to society. And then what are the opportunities that we can access? And for example, for government, you know, digitalization can do an enormous amount, for example, around the whole question of benefits, our understanding of the data, you know, getting proper data and up-to-date data that allows us to, um, to formulate policy in a better way. You know, this is, this is literally a revolution that's going to sweep through, you know, sweep, sweep through the country and the wider world. And I, I, I feel, I mean, it is an extraordinary missing part of the, you know, of the, of the debate. I, I had a conversation with someone the other day and I, I was just reflecting on, on this, and they said to me, well, what do you think is the most important company for the future in, in Britain today, most important company operating? And I was sort of thinking of the car industry or the pharma industry or Airbus or whatever it is. And they said, well, DeepMind's the most important company that's for the future. And by the way, two or three years ago, for reasons I completely understand, it was taken over by Google, who are now going to sink however many billions it requires into that in order to be ahead in the field of artificial intelligence. I think we're not even the policy debate. I, I don't even see us putting this on the agenda yet. And yet these are massive questions for the future. So I think the, the thing is, the reason why I think it's, it's, it's important that we set a debate about, for example, child poverty in this broader context is that if the economy and the world changes really fast around us, if we don't, if we're not geared to deal with those changes, when we come to deal with this issue, we'll find we're, you know, we're falling short. And we're having an old fashioned debate about, you know, how we increase benefit here or there in constrained circumstances, rather than setting it within the context of a much bigger debate about what are the social and economic changes you are going to have to have, as I say, at this moment when the world is going to change probably faster than it's ever changed in, in our lifetime. Great. Amy? Do you want anything on that? Um, well, just uh, because we've got another hour or so, haven't we, before we finish? I, no. I thought I'd about, take on... about 10 seconds. I thought I, thought I would take on the, the, the basic okay. universal basic incomes debate. Okay. <laughs> um, I, Can you please don't start a riot? <laughs> um, I think there is something deeply pessimistic about the really quite popular argument at the moment, which goes, we are all going to be replaced by robots. And the only way through that is to tax the robot owners, who are going to be delighted to pay the taxes, um, in order to pay us all universal basic incomes. And I, I mean, that's obviously um, a caricature, but it is the direction that some of that thinking goes. And I think I really just want to echo that we I need agree. to think more carefully about what we can do to steer technology so it's not simply benefiting the people who already have the most, um, probably younger people um, who have the most technological ability, but that we somehow bend it to improve the productivity, to improve the lives of people who are, have been left behind and are being left behind at the moment, but that we don't do that by saying, let's run all our benefits on digital by default, facing people who can't cope with those, with those systems at the moment with, with something that then ends up with them in even worse circumstances than they are at the moment. We need to think more intelligently about what we can do to bend technology overall. But that is several hours worth of debate. Okay, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not, maybe do you have any closing remarks before uh, we wrap up? Yeah, just my closing remark, it, it goes back to the whole issue about tax. 
and I think it's an issue about culture. And because I'm retired and don't have a job, I can say whatever I want. Um, and people always look to Scandinavia. And one of the things, one of the explanations about why the Scandinavians tolerate higher tax levels is they trust their politicians and they believe in public services. So they realize that if you want good public services, you have to pay for them. I had an extraordinary experience when I became a senior civil servant, speaking to a colleague who I won't mention. I said, I really think I should pay more tax because I was making a lot of money. This is a civil servant, you know, but I was in childcare, so I was making a lot of money. And the, per the, the person I was talking to looked at me like I was out of my mind. You trust them to look after your money? <laughs> and there is a fundamental problem, I think, in Anglophone countries in the US, in the UK, in Australia, not so much Canada anymore, about do we believe in public services and are we willing to pay for them? And I think that's the argument we have to have with the wider public cross party. Great. Look, uh, can we um, thank our panel for coming along today? <laughs> you, you probably um, you heard lots of it. You probably agreed with some and disagreed with others. But if we left you with one thing uh, to take away, it would be that politics is not a game. Uh, policy matters and fatalism is a disaster. So if you could go out and kind of remove the fatalism, that would be a good thing. Have a good day, uh, everyone. <laughs>